Well, gentlemen, it's been a while since uh, the three of us have been on, and uh, I, I'm just thinking the other day, I, I'm going to refer to you as my Tokyo correspondence. I hope that's all Makes right. Makes sense. Good to be back. It's been, it has been a while, hasn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So Justin and Salim are back. And uh, the last time we spoke, there was something that uh, I wanted to, I, I need to kind of cough up and say, uh, guys, I was wrong. And that was that the uh, Summer Olympics actually did happen in Tokyo back in the summer. And I didn't think it would. I think none of us should ever doubt the power of a giant PR marketing firm named Dentsu. <laughs> How, tell me more about that. Why, why would a marketing firm make the Olympics actually happen? Well, I mean, amongst many other reasons, there's just had a huge amount of capital invested in it. They had a lot of contracts that they were banking on. And if the games don't go on, a lot of those things don't vest for them. And it's kind of one of those too big to fail type of things. So not just Dentsu, but obviously there's the, you know, there's the actual positive reflection upon the country being on the world stage. And I'm sure in many ways, Japan wanted to present a, a positive version of how things could go off even in the midst of a global p pandemic. And I think we kind of alluded to this as well, Salim and I a bit in that last discussion around the Olympics about the realities of the winter Olympics coming up in less than a year in China from that period, um, right? literally a handful of months and how that would from an optic standpoint appear if that were to go off without the Tokyo Olympics 2020, 2021 Olympics actually being put on. So, yeah, I mean, Dentsu is, is I, I don't mean to make them the boogeyman here, but Dentsu had a huge amount uh, riding on it and, and as did many other entities. But uh, with the television rights, only vesting with the airing of the games. Uh, I'm sure that they were the most relieved party of the many that were tied into the Olympics. And they got, uh, I, I can't remember now, did they get fans there into the, into the stands? Or I think they did, didn't they? For some events? or In a very limited capacity, yes. Uh, so there were some prefectures, which are the equivalent of um, states or provinces, that did allow for uh, spectators to attend. But for, I'd say, 90% of the events, it was um, all without uh, without spectators. Hmm. Well, I'm glad they went on. It's uh, And it seemed like there weren't any major incidents that I recall from covid um, there were a couple of weird stories that emerged that, uh, tend to happen anyway, not regardless of where, but, uh, one comes to mind and the, did you guys ever hear about the, there was a, someone who punched a horse or something in the equestrian or not equestrian, but it was some type of, maybe it was equestrian. Someone punched a horse because it wasn't doing what it was yeah, supposed to be happened. doing. <laughs> it was, a, it was and I think I, it was the coach. Yeah. Yeah, and I actually heard a little bit about that. That uh, when the when they do this event in the countries that they hold them in, the horses are loaned by the home country, I guess, so that they don't have to ship horses to the, the Olympic Games. So the the controversy that's come out of this apparently is that, or the perhaps change that may come out of it is that no longer they're going to just probably get rid of this event because it's logistically too difficult for them to actually bring their own horses, you know, to, to these Olympics. And maybe COVID also had a factor in to it as well, bringing the animals in. But, uh, but yeah, that's the one sort of semi strange. Do you guys remember anything else sort of strange coming out of it? Nothing strange or nothing that I recall that, that was particularly strange, but yeah, I mean, uh, on a, on a more positive note, I think it was a, a, pretty good Olympics. Uh, not, not least because Japan did pretty well. Uh, and um, it was obviously good, good to watch. Uh, and a lot of, uh, a lot of sports that 
I don't typically follow that I got to see because it was the Olympics that were actually um, pretty interesting. Um, like fencing, for instance, which I don't typically typically watch, but I, I thought that was particularly interesting. Mm -hmm. Taekwondo, uh, which again, something that I'd never followed before I thought was uh, really cool. Um, separately, skateboarding was really awesome to see this uh, this year and, and Japan did particularly well, um, especially on the on the women's side. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, all around, I thought it was it was great. It's so long ago now, or feels like so long ago. I really don't remember all that much. I don't remember how Canada did. I don't remember. I think I don't remember a lot. So, and maybe uh, the listeners will have forgotten by now. But I did want to just open up by saying, you guys were right. the 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 Olympics did happen. I'm glad they happened. But I was. I just didn't think it was they were going to be able to pull it off. And uh, I'm glad they did. Corporate interests in politics. Sometimes that machine, it just uh, it gets things done. And, and a place like here is prime example for, you know, bureaucracy getting things in motion. I, I remember maybe two months out or maybe uh, just, just short of two months out, they started painting the streets with the Tokyo 2020 bus signs on the streets. And yeah. once, those, once that paint went down on the street, I said to myself, oh, it's a done deal. <laughs> once the once the bureaucracy kicks into motion and they're telling those guys out in the Department of Transportation or whatever the equivalent of that is here, get out yeah. there, start painting the roads and mark for the shuttle buses for the athletes. Once that happens, that's somebody up high saying, this is happening. Like, it's going to go. It's go time. Yeah, yeah exactly. For sure. hmm. Interesting. Yeah. But, you know, circling back to the to the um, horse abuser, you know, as and, and it's interesting what you said about how how it's actually the host country that provides the horses for the, the equestrian related events. I mean, you know, getting punched in the face may be bad, but it's better than the alternative. The horse could have ended up as horse sashimi or something, you know, it's entirely possible that horse could have been a delicacy in mm. another prefecture instead of out on that dressage course. So I'm sure that I'm sure the horse took that punch like a champ. <laughs> And I, and I noticed it was not a German, or was it? Sorry, it was not a Japanese person that did. Yeah. It was a Jap. It was a German. The German coach punched the, um, punched the horse, and and it was uh, apparently. So they're now, they're making a move to get rid of the sport. Um, they voted to. As they said after 109 years, modern pentathlon's governing body has voted secretly to remove horse riding and replace it with cycling. For, for the next Olympics. They could stand but, to, you know, modernize a bit more. I mean, to Salim's point before about some of the events that stuck out. I mean, skateboarding was fantastic. I would say for many years, the Olympics kind of has, it's kind of struggled with other games that have started to eat its lunch when it comes to drawing in younger viewers, like the X Games that the ESPN used to put on for years and years. Mm -hmm. And they'd have all these great events that are kind of now being carried by the Olympics, surfing, skateboarding, speed rock climbing, things like that. And uh, if anything, that, that could help in kind of freshening things up a, a bit, but Skateboarding stuck out to me more than anything because not just, a, you know, you had two women and one man, I believe, that won yeah, gold right. in events for skateboarding. But they did so in a country that's not really that hospitable to skateboarding. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's not a lot of access to skateboarding parks in Japan. and Yeah, and it's probably not tolerated to what you see in, in public, some places where... no here they've put up all these little metal pieces on like things that they might jump up to slide mm. along. And yeah. that was always a big thing in the city. In mm -hmm. the core is skateboarders in the middle of the day drove people absolutely crazy. <laughs> so they were building all these little ways of trying to stop them from doing it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'd rather the city's focus on trying to stop skateboarders than try and create impediments to homeless people sleeping on benches, which is what yeah. cities yeah. spend way too much resources totally. on. But no, yeah. don't mean to get too far afield. This episode is brought to you by Pace Painting. Pace Painting, serving all your painting needs, whether it's commercial or residential. Now, full disclosure, Pete is my brother-in-law, and I would recommend him to do work for anyone. He's done several jobs for us. We've always been satisfied. We've recommended him to friends and family. He's great. 
Email Peter at paintwithpace at gmail.com or visit his Facebook page at Pace Painting Inc. That's paintwithpace at gmail.com or visit his Facebook page, Pace Painting Inc. I didn't really tell everybody what we were going to talk about today, did I? So I'll, I'll give a, a quick overview. So I wanted to catch up a little on Tokyo. We did that. I, I do want to talk about something that's been really bothering me recently about job searching. And uh, I'm not currently job searching, but I know friends who are, and I've also been through this in the past, the frustrations, uh, and I don't know if it's the what I can call it the modern day frustrations of job searching, because I think to a certain extent, this has probably been going on for a very long time, but we'll talk about that. Then last episode with Paul, we did a rapid fire round, which I, I liked, and I've heard some good feedback on. So we're going to introduce that or use that in today's episode. Then we'll uh, talk about what we're watching, what we're reading, listening to, and then wrap up. So I don't good. think we're going to have time for a weird news story today. But <laughs> if we do, we'll talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Job. Sir, sorry, Salim, you want to say something? You need to get more whiskey? <laughs> I could use another. Actually, let me pour myself uh, Let me pour myself something. Yeah. See, Salim's, Salim's getting his, uh, his, his whiskey, and all I can think of is Will Ferrell. You know, scotch, 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 scotch. <laughs> Don't know that one. It's from Anchorman. Uh, one or two? I think the first one. Oh, fantastic. I just finished my bottle. <laughs> Did you? So, so yeah. Salim's showing the uh, bottle of 16-year Lagavulin. This is, this, is which, so uh, this is so good. The, the, of the PD ones, it, it is, is the, the best, best one, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. Ar- Ardberg doesn't even hold a candle. I was going to get a Laphroaig. Um, yeah. Order cask, because because I'd heard good things. Um, but when I saw this, I was like, "Nah, I'm getting this." <laughs> I saw it at the liquor store here. We call it the liquor store, the LCBO in Canada or Toronto or Ontario Liquor Control Board of Ontario, shortened to LCBO, and and that's, that's how they advertise title. themselves. Yeah, LCBO. It just sort of rolls off the tongue now. I guess people don't even think about what it stands for. Um, 150 Canadian for that bottle that you're, you're that's, drinking. That's which, a lot. Uh, that's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. So that would be about 120 American, maybe. Which is overpriced. Because US. Japan, that bottle's eight, like, what, 60 to I got 80? it for 8,000 yen, which is like, what, yeah. 70 bucks? Yeah. US? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. in Canada, it's a ripoff. Yeah. And, and and booze in Japan isn't known to be like cheaper yeah. than other places, yeah. right? Yeah. It's certainly cheaper than Singapore, but it, it's not cheaper it's normally not than uh, either. other parts. No, I thought the taxes were pretty high on, in Japan, although they're high in um, they're clearly high in Canada compared to Canada. So Canada's known the the uh, the the liquor taxes in Canada are are, are pretty high. Like they're about fifty percent on a on a bottle of wine. When you buy like a holy crap a twenty dollar bottle of wine, that bottle of wine is probably ten in, oh, in wow. other parts of the world. Wow. No, so you got to keep those salary men working. <laughs> Clark, you know, keep those tariffs <laughs> low on the liquor. Well, let's get into this job search. Um, I probably should have had a couple of shots before I bring this up, <laughs> but um, and for those of for those that may not know, Justin uh, spends time in this. Uh, this is part of his. Uh, how he makes a living is in the world of job recruitment or, or head hunting. I don't know if have I, have I ever asked you. Do you do you dislike when people call you a head hunter, or do you kind of do you like it? Or? <laughs> I don't really, I don't really care. I mean, it, there, it's a dirty word for some, for sure. Uh, yeah. I think I think from a company perspective, it's a cost uh, because they're having to pay a fee to an outside resource, and they're also having to trust an outside resource to source people that they believe maybe otherwise they should be able to source, whether it be through their brand reputation or through their internal network. And then from a standpoint of candidates, a lot of times it's kind of a dirty word from the standpoint of, you know, I'm happy in my job. I'm happy I'm you know, doing what I'm doing, or I don't want to move, or I haven't considered my career more broadly. And a lot of recruiters are seen as just I don't know, a a pest or, you know, or a parasite in some cases. And don't get me wrong. There are definitely some that are truly, truly terrible, manipulative, pushy and everything in between. I think it's kind of one of those things that a lot of people don't want one until they need one. 
And that's right. not kind of how it works. Hmm. And maybe we can go into that in a little bit in this discussion. But, you know, most okay. recruiters are sourcing people for jobs, not jobs for people. And when people yes. need a recruiter, maybe isn't necessarily when the market or the job availability reflects what you want. And when you say when people, you mean when like a person's looking for a job, right? Whether because like, they have to, or because they really feel they need have to, because they've lost a job or want to return to work or want to, because they want to transition, whether it be for their career or because they just need to get out of a bad situation. Mm. Okay. So this is good. We have some context or we have the right, uh, the right person on the panel here to give us a bit of perspective from, so you can use a bit of your professional background on this podcast. This isn't all just for, for pleasure, Justin. This, uh, <laughs> we're, we're kind of putting you to work a, a bit on this. So, um, I, I bring this topic up because I have some, f uh, a couple friends out there who are job searching. I, before I came to, uh, back to Canada was in, in a job search, uh, looking for, uh, either to stay in Japan at that time or go somewhere else in the world or come back to Canada. So I had to go through, um, the process of job searching. And one of the things that I, I find extremely frustrating to hear is, well, first of all, when you're ta first ta starting to talk to somebody about a job and the, the employer makes the statement, Yep, yeah, we're, we're going to move quickly on this one. Hmm. Uh, we, we need to hire, we need to hire quickly. You know, they set the tone in a way that there's a sense of urgency. And so as a candidate who's looking for a job, that's exactly what you want to hear. And um, I've got one friend in particular who um, had had a, started a conversation in back in July, hearing those very words. <laughs> and here we are at end of November. Oh, wow. And he just got called back for like a sixth interview Sick. or something. Oh, and God. and they're down to like two candidates or something like that, and they have been told, um, it, yeah, it's going to happen here. We're going to we're, we're now we're going to move quickly at this point. So you know, stay tuned. You'll hear back from us. And I just find I hear that some, and I went through it too. I just mm -hmm. so I I wonder like I know there's that old phrase, hire fast. Uh, no, no, sorry, fire fast, hire slow. Uh, take a lot of time before you hire people. Really make sure you got it right. When you got a bad can, somebody out there that's just you got to get just get rid of them quick. Don't don't go through messy m months or whatever. But th it just seems to be uh, like the impact it has on people emotionally. Mm -hmm. I remember I told somebody at my previous employer, I said, we do a great job of interviewing people, putting them through the ringer, pissing them off so much, and then offer them a job that they don't have no energy to say no. <laughs> they just say, they throw the white flag up and say, yes, I'll take it. Mm -hmm. Like, is that how you want to bring someone into an organization after you actually do finally offer the job? So I don't know if you can tell, but it's a frustrating thing. And it's tough because I, I feel bad for people, especially those that don't have jobs right. who go through this. So I have like, Salim, I'm going to just ask you for a second. Have you had that kind of experience? Have you heard about that kind of experience? People going through that as you search, yeah. were searching? And then we can get some of Justin's feedback on it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I have personally had experience like that. And surprisingly, it was um, at an employer where I'd actually wor where I actually was working. So... Um, like it you was were looking for an I, internal role or? Yeah. So it was an internal role. Um, they'd, uh, the, the hiring manager had approached me. They'd approached me to say, you know, what we, we, we want to, to consider you um, as a, as a potential applicant. You'd be, you'd be a shoe in for the role. Uh, and you know, many conversations later, I was like, ah, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> we, we filled the role with someone else. I was like, what I mean, I I thought this was um, mm -hmm. this was going to happen, and uh, and it was a very drawn out process as well. This was not uh, you know just it wasn't like two weeks conversation. This was uh, months, and uh, and after all that, and and look, I mean, it wasn't something that I was originally looking for, but once you get into that conversation, and and the the, the hiring manager in this case was really convincing me that this was the you know the perfect role for me, and uh, and and I started thinking that that was potentially the case 
uh, as well. And so then you're it being kind of built all, all up as apart. well in the process. You've been you've been approached. You've been built up. You're starting to then something you weren't even contemplating is now something that's in your the wheels are turning on this. Exactly. Yeah. So it it, it was just incredibly frustrating that um, after all that you you know that you you go through that process as as people do with you know with the interviews and with everything that's associated with that and uh, and you know we're all, we're all human, right? We're all we're always also thinking about oh you know. How am I going to fit into that role? What do I need to be doing? How am I going to prepare? Uh, there's there's a mental toll that uh, you know that takes place where um, it's it's just not it's not it's not easy, right? It's not it's not necessarily fun either, and uh, it's 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 a lot of work. So you know, being disappointed after all that is is super stressful. And and this is not just me. Obviously, I know people who have gone through uh, similar experiences when they were looking for for jobs. And and going through going through a, a very drawn out process and not getting anywhere with that. So um, it's not always the case. Um, I have had experiences personally, and one well, sorry, not experiences, one one experience, uh, and I've uh, heard of other experience, people's experiences where it was a lot a lot smoother. Where um, they go through you know one two three interviews and and here here you go here's, here's the job offer and. In in my view, that's kind of the ideal way to go, obviously. Um, but that's certainly not not the case. Eighty percent of the time, I'd say. When you talk about that mental toll thing, I, I was uh, about fifteen years ago was potentially looking to take a job in L.A. when I was working at the company I was working with, and because that was such a, a big deal, that that would mean moving to a different country. It would be living in a different climate. Um, I spent. I, you know, I, I turned down opportunities to do things like I, my whole planning of for like a year changed. Like people were saying, are you going to come back to the team next year? Are you going to be uh, doing this? You know, I was in a theater group. Um, people were asking me and I couldn't commit to anything because I wasn't mm. sure if I'd be around. And mm. I started getting into I was looking up softball leagues in California. Oh, wow. They play all year round. I was getting all into it. And so I put, I did pause my life in a lot of ways mm-hmm. and, um, it was, it was frustrating. And then this whole Japan thing, I didn't know whether I was coming home. I had a tenant here. So now, okay, I get it. That's not the employer's problem. The employer right. to a certain degree, it's not. However, if you want a candidate, it is kind of their problem oh, absolutely. as Justin is nodding in <laughs> approval. So, or, or an agreement. So now Justin can you defend this in any way? Um, are you as frustrated as a recruiter about this? Because you must, this must drive you crazy too. Okay. So maybe I should give a little bit of background here. Um, before I did exclusively work in, in the executive search and contingency search, executive search meaning usually retained. Company is going to utilize me as a partner, pay me a retained fee, devote resources and staff my team specifically to their job to work on a key role usually so you're someone, like a, a, you're attached to almost as a like a, like you said a retainer so you're you're there in the background and you get called in as time whenever like almost like an addition of staff to the the employer that you're retained by it's almost like mutual exclusivity so you know all the candidates related to this function are only going to go to this company in this job and and they're only going to utilize me to source the person for that role. Won't be other recruiters, won't be other firms, et cetera. And then contingency, which is just success-based, right? You know, we have these three job recs, uh, one in underwriting, one in claims, and one in sales, and maybe an actuary. And uh, essentially, we need help uh, across all these four, four departments at different levels. Could be senior manager, could be director, could be entry level. And uh, based on the resources you have in this area, can you support us? And, you know, I'm usually pretty straightforward. These are the ones that I see as priority just based on uh, time and what I can support you on. And also based on the feedback I'm getting from them as to some of the questions you pose at the beginning of this conversation, which is stages of the, of the interview process, um, how long it's going to take, who's being engaged in the conversation, who are the stakeholders, how clear are they on the hiring process? So uh, if I can kind of dive into a, a couple of these different pieces, you mentioned towards the top a friend who who had engaged in a process starting in July, and here we are at the end of November, and they're still going on. 
Um, in financial services, what I can say is there are several big firms that have absurdly long hiring processes. One of the largest financial services firms in the world, uh, we'll say an American one, uh, they have typically run anywhere from 10 to 15 interviews. And I know people that they've spent the time calculating how much money the company spent on interviewing them and flying them out and flying out other members that were part of the interviewing process. And it was averaging like twenty to $30,000 per person. And you multiply that by three to five people that they bring out for the final rounds. And the salary for the role is less than what they actually spend on the search. And that's not even taking into account that some of those candidates were probably presented by recruiters. So the company's also paying a fee on top of it all, right? Jeez. So the and whole- And I'm assuming yeah. that's not, that is not considered, like I can, I can accept the fact it costs money to make a decision and make the right decision. Sure. So to say it's going to cost several thousand dollars to, to decide if this is the right candidate is not an unreasonable thing. Right. Right. But if you spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars just flying people around to talk to people, yeah, that seems a little bit crazy. A lot of times it feels like it's an insulation by the process. So that way, if we run it through this whole thing and all of these different stakeholders and all these steps have been gone through, we went through all these different steps. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't hang on Clark. It doesn't hang on Salim. It hangs on, you know what? It just didn't work out. We went through the process. We thought we had somebody based on our criteria. It's got to be the person. You know, it, it insulates a lot of times any kind of need to re imagine, reconsider how the process is running. Uh, if I can say there's something that kind of sticks in my head quite frequently in all this. And, you know, what, what got me started in executive search was years ago, there were some projects that I used to do in the US called executive transition management. And what we would do is we would go in a three, three part process. The first part was you would go in and do a mini organizational assessment kind of around the role. And you would do kind of almost like a 360 feedback around that role. And typically it's only for senior management type of role, right? We're looking at like SVPs, C-suite type of roles. And you go in, you do the assessment and you basically create a completely brand new job description based on all the ideals that have been identified through that process. And then the second part is you actually run the search with the company, uh, basically as a retained search partner. And then post hire, you provide executive coaching, right? And that seems like a lot of investment. And it is, you know, the company is saying quite clearly, listen, we are going to bring on the CFO, the COO, and we need this person to be successful. And if there's competencies that need to be worked on, if there's pieces that are blind spots that we're identifying in the first six to 12 months, we're going to work through those. We're not going to take this as something that washes out, you know, after two years or three years, this is an essential part of our organization. And a company is going to say, you know, that's a big investment that we made. But in the grand scheme of things, oftentimes it's actually much, much less than what I just described a moment ago with that big financial services firm that spent a year's worth or a year and a half's worth of salary just to bring on a member for that one role. Now, I'm not saying that all companies should shift to a model like that. But what I am saying is you can replicate, a company can replicate pieces of that and actually have very clear hiring processes where the interviewing stakeholder, stakeholders are engaged from the beginning of the, the process. And it's very clear how, who, and when those people are going to speak with the candidates and how that fits across a grid of what is it acceptable within their thresholds to continue moving the process forward. And then coming together at the end as a committee and making a group hiring decision. And that can be done in an entity that's 50 to 100 people or an entity that's several thousand people. You just break it down into very specific stakeholders. They're going to be doing those things. So what's the disconnect in all of these things? Communication. It's always communication. So Clark, you mentioned before, and Salim, you were alluding to before as well, having gone through a process internally or having people who've applied to for jobs in your company and been extremely frustrated by how the process went and how everything ended up in the end. And it could feel like you're being jerked around in many ways or even manipulated 
and being brought into the fold. But from my perspective, a lot of times it's just a complete disconnect in communication. It's you have HR and talent acquisition that a lot of times are afraid to engage the senior members and the people who are making the higher decision and having very frank discussions about what are the expectations that we're looking at here? What are the, what's the team build or make up right now and the competencies that we need to uh, fill that we've lost or that we need to leverage based on the, the team that we have currently composed. And a lot of people, especially in this market, I can't speak for every market. I mean, I did work in, especially in the tri-state area in, 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 with insurance, financial services, consumer goods, and technology firms. And it's a little bit more mature there. But here in Japan, I think the real big challenge that a lot of HR and talent acquisition members have is they don't have a lot of the training, development, learning side of things. And they don't really know how to help compose a team with their hiring managers. And the hiring managers aren't necessarily equipped to do that either. So, you know, the communication piece is the biggest part from the foundation. If they're not having those discussions at the beginning and saying, okay, what's the job description? All right. Does this even make sense? (laughs) Will this make sense to the outside? Does this make sense to our team? Is this still how the job is actually conducted within our team? Is this what the job looks like outside in our competitors or in other, you know, other industries for that matter? And then the next stage is that is who's part of the discussion? Okay. Are all of those people here? Just the basic logistical thing. Are all those people here? Are all, they, are all of them going to be available over the next six weeks for us to have these discussions? Because typical hiring process really should not take more than six weeks, right? Four that interviews. That seems reasonable. Four interviews. Yeah. That's it. I think that's very reasonable. Yeah. Well, you know, as you were talking, there were a few things that were jumping out at me. So one of them is the the whole self-esteem aspect of this. Like when you get the the messaging that comes there's a few things that affect self esteem when it comes to job searches things like whenever i would interview with someone i always sent a thank you after that was a, a no brainer for me not everyone does it so it's one way to stand out and i didn't do it just for that i did it because i wanted to thank people and i i really appreciated if somebody wrote back whoever i interviewed with and they said yeah it was great to meet you too uh, you know, good luck with the process. That's one response I got. I, I have to say, when I don't get a response back, that that really it bo- it 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 bothers me. And I th- I think it's kind of arrogant to me that if someone sends you a thanks for the interview, it was nice meeting you today. What kind of person doesn't write back and say, yeah, it was great to meet you too. Good luck. We'll we'll be in touch or or just anything. To me, that whole, it falls into this black hole and they don't respond. I just feel like that person is an asshole. It tells you something about the company that you're going to work for, right? I I think that's great. I mean, if you send someone an email after you've been interviewed, like a hiring manager, for instance, or or someone associated uh, with that, you send a thank you email and they don't bother to send an email back, I think that sends a a huge message to you saying, uh, you know, as a red flag saying, Hey, maybe this, these guys uh, just aren't worth working with, right? I mean, if uh, or is that their uh, way of saying they don't like me? Like again, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You wonder, right? Is it right? Yeah, yeah. The personal totally. style. This is someone who doesn't write back to people to say thanks. It was nice to meet you too. You know, point number one. Point number two. They don't have the they don't have the um, the the courtesy to do it. Maybe they do this in other areas of how they operate. If this is going to be your future boss, you're going to have all kinds of issues relating to this type of stuff where they're just not offering common courtesy and what kind of place are, are they working for and what do they represent? No, I totally. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that one really bothers me is when, when I don't hear back from the, the person I've, I've thanked. And I don't think I'm out of line when I say that, that that's not a reasonable way to, f- to feel. No, no, you're not out of line at all. And uh, kind of circling back to something we were talking about before that directly relates to this. Or being sensitive. Yeah. Being too sensitive, you know, because someone might say that, Clark, you know, relax. Like not everybody has time to write back. You know, they do. They do have time. It takes 30 seconds Mm -hmm. to write back. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 no. It's a hot button thing for you. There's nothing wrong with that. But it that, is. But that it doesn't is. mean it. That doesn't mean it's something you're being too sensitive about. Um, so you know, again, my role, <laughs> my role is oftentimes kind of sin eater. 
Um, I'm there to swallow all the ugliness of the client and the candidate. The client's mm-hmm. having a meltdown. The candidate's having a meltdown for different reasons. You know, why isn't the candidate giving us what we want and, and, and doing exactly and marching to exactly the, the beat of our drum? We have this great reputation. We are the number one company in X, Y, and Z. Why aren't, why aren't they coming to us? And mm-hmm. the candidate is, you know, equally extremely frustrated that they're not getting any kind of response. They're not getting any kind of feedback. They're not getting any kind of actionable information that helps understand what the next stage of the process may be, when it may be, and how long am I going to, as you were both alluding to, you know, how long am I going to kind of put everything in pause on limbo, in limbo, you know, in my life? And and as I kind of consider what the next step of my, my career, my life, everything else that's tied to that. And uh, my role in the middle is to kind of say, okay, you know, let's let's talk about expectations. Let's talk about what you need to know. And then on the flip side, equipping both sides with what the candidate really needs to hear and and talk about in, in these conversations so they understand that they're joining not just a, a a great role, a great function, a great team, but but why it's an organization that's going to support them or put them in a position to continue to progress. And then on the flip side, you know, preparing the candidate to ask those questions in a way that the that they're going to get the information that they need and it's not coming across in a in a confronting way or in a fr- or affrontive or anything like that. And I think what you're, what you're talking about, you know, Clark, in terms of not getting any kind of communication, I mean, it's extremely frustrating. I mean, imagine you go through and you both have either experienced or seen this yourselves in other people that you know, you know, you go through multiple stages and you get zero feedback, nothing, nothing at all. Not, not one bit of, you know, this was great. Um, if you think about maybe working on these type of things, it, it would probably help you, you know, moving forward. Yeah. That's and, the other thing you don't get to is feedback on why things yeah. didn't work out. Usually you don't. But I, I do want to take a moment to pivot here for a second, though. As frustrating as some of these things may be, and you know, you were saying at the very beginning of the conversation, I'm not actively looking for a job. You know, this is not recruiter me talking. This is just, this is actually more the coach side of me talking. It's good to be on people's radar, Right. If you're in a really big organization and you have the opportunity to collaborate with other teams and other departments on things, you get on people's radar and they they can see what you can do beyond the spectrum of what they assume is your job. And maybe there are things that could work on their side of things or work in something else that they move on to themselves internally or externally. And I think that being on people's radar actively is important. Whether or not you're actively looking for a job, there should be very intentional conversations that you're having with other departments and even sometimes with people in other organizations that you know loosely within the industry. So there's an understanding of what they're doing there, what your job looks like at that company. And then in the long run, these are the people that you can tap, whether because you have to or you want to, to consider what the next steps of your career may be. And you know, I know you're both very, very effective networkers. You, you're, you're very, very clear minded about, you know, what it is that you do and what you can and cannot do. But I, I would say from a conversation like this, if there's anything that I would say that anyone's kind of thinking about the broad spectrum of, of what life career, excuse me, the career um, continuum may look like, I think it's very, very important to not carry your network alone and not do all the work alone. I think it's very important to bring people together that are in your network. So they're meeting each other. They're seeing the value of your network amongst them and that they're getting a sense of what it is, not only what you're doing, but what you're trying to do in your current job. So they can start to think more proactively in the back of their minds. Okay. I'm working on this new project or I'm launching this new division or we're working on these new products how do I build this? Oh, there's that guy I spoke with, Clark, or there's a guy I spoke with before, Salim, who is spot on in these areas. Mm. Maybe I should talk with him and see what it is that he's thinking about doing next. But are so, you thinking this is going to help save some of this frustration in any way? Like, Or is it still come down to just some people aren't very courteous and, and some companies are disorganized? Like, Does any of this help with the, some of that, do you think? On the candidate side... 
I think it's just, it starts to become kind of like Teflon. It kind of slides off you in a way because it becomes more about how is it, how it is you're serving your career and your progression and less about getting too caught up in the dynamic of just the realities of some of these companies. I mean, we were just talking about huge bureaucracies about the Olympics and, you know, some of the companies that people are going to interview with are, are huge bureaucracies. And a lot of times getting somebody who's going to be very clear in their response, feedback, next steps, communication, even, I mean, onboarding, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of organizations that will hire people and, uh, they walk in and they're working for this massive company, a massive tech firm. And then you walk in the door and guess what, you know, that one paragraph job description, that's all you got. You're going to have to figure it all out from here. You know, you're going to fill in all the blanks and there's a lot of blanks. There are a lot of blanks. Well, I thought where you were going to go with that was that I, I remember a few years back, I worked for a company where some new some new person would show up and their email wasn't even set up. Like they, they didn't have email for like a, a couple of weeks into the job. Like what does that say to somebody when they're, or their computer is just, it's a monitor with a plug and there's no like, um, computer attached to it, or there's a computer and there's no monitor sitting there, and it's just <laughs> just a, a space with dust around it where there was. And someone probably took it while they were uh, uh, the last person left, so they stole the monitor. But yeah, you get people coming in where it's like people, are like, oh, who are you? Or you know, it's just another way that people. Can, that's another topic in itself. People getting welcomed into organizations in such a disorganized way. Um, yeah, Salim, you were going to say something. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, I think. You know, as as difficult as as it is, sort of two two points. One, as difficult as it is, it's typically, I mean, when when you need a job is when you're going to struggle the most trying to get responses, trying to get traction with um, with employers. You might be looking at multiple employers as well, so having to go through uh, the the same pain over and over again with different with different people with different organizations, um, as opposed to when uh, a company is, is looking for you in particular, and I think the conversation is really different. Um, so. That's so true. Yeah, the intensity level, the stress uh, while searching without a job versus searching with a job. It's, um, it's completely different. I mean, it's, 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 a whole, it's a whole other world, right? And um, I think the second, the second point is also uh, to, Justin's, to Justin, Justin's point, uh, networking. Uh, and how important that is. And uh, when you have that network and when, uh, let's say, the, the hiring manager is someone that you know or um, you know some, someone senior in an organization where, where you're applying, you might not necessarily have to have to wait because you can ring that person up and say, hey, what's going on? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and that certainly... And I love uh, doing that. I love... Changes the dynamics. I love introducing people to... Maybe there is maybe there is a current job. Maybe there isn't a current job. Maybe the chances of being hired for that job are, are minimal. But uh, I love putting a, a person I know with another person mm -hmm. I know. Then, mm -hmm. like you said, when the opportunity maybe comes up that's for for somebody uh, in the future, then that's maybe the first name they think of. Um, you got to well, make it known. If you don't, if you're not making it known, let's say you know two months later you you start your new job and you're at company X. And a person at company Y, whom you've known for 15 years in the industry, knows you very well, believes in you, trusts you, knows your reputation. And they say to you, Clark, I didn't know you were looking for a job. Why didn't you tell me? Yeah. I mean, that or I didn't know they were looking for a job. Yeah. And if I only I had known, yeah. I would have. Absolutely. So if you're not on their radar, they're not going to think about it. And if you're not letting some of your intentions known, can't expect otherwise. Okay, so rapid fire round. I'm going to set the timer for two minutes. I'm think I'm going to make this work. When when you hear this sound, that means we have reached the end of our time. So it's two minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> get a bucket. We'll uh, we'll we'll get. Uh, we've got. F I don't know if we're going to have time for all of these, but we'll say five or six of these topics. A couple of ones that I brought. You guys brought a couple. And we're going to go through these. We've got two minutes to um, talk talk about why it's a topic. And first topic, this is mine. What's the one country you would not visit? So I, I call this my personal 
sanctioned countries list. Well, the countries <laughs> I would not visit. So I'm going to start the timer. For me, Saudi Arabia is my country I would, I would never visit. Uh, at least... Why? Because I'm afraid. I'm afraid <laughs> I, would, I would disappear into the political scenery. I also have a lot of things about the country that I, I, I disagree with. You know, the justice system there, the, some of the horrible political stories that we hear about people that uh, get, you know, things like there's this guy, not a Canadian, but he's related to it, uh, or he's been arrested for some Facebook post that he made, and now he's been imprisoned. He's been like lashed a bunch of times. He's, there's no, it's horrible. So I'm not going to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. But you're um, from the Middle East, look, right, Salim? So am, you may have some personal th- thoughts on this. Right, and many yeah. of the countries <laughs> on sudden. many do not sanction lists tend to show up in your, that part of the world. But I, I, I know, right? And, and I've been to Saudi Arabia, so, um, and, uh, and I'm still here. So <laughs> that, that maybe says something. Um, I'm going to take this another way and say there's, there are no, there's no country that I would not visit. Mm. Um, I, I, I like the challenge. I like uh, some of the places that I want to visit are probably some of the, you know, scariest play places um on earth like i i would love to see certain countries in in west africa for instance uh, I, I would um a place like um iran for instance is is a place I'd another lo- I'd country love to visit. I north korea I, I wouldn't go no. no you know so yeah that's that's what that's what i'm okay. thinking justin off to you yeah i'm with 26 you. 26 seconds i'm with you salim i mean you know the one country i think i would mention i i would afraid to mention because you know what if an opportunity comes and i have to go visit there and they're going to find out that i said it and i'm screwed i did think <laughs> about that i thought i'm going to show up at immigration in one of these places and they're going to be like ah here you are okay <laughs> at the 45 minute marker i heard you mention this about our country <laughs> <laughs> well there it is okay you don't have to say by the bell justin okay so next topic let's go with one of yours thanksgiving is among us now or it's currently going on in the u.s u.s thanksgiving justin wants to know what our favorite comfort food is whether it's holiday related or not i guess is okay so i'm gonna so justin i'm gonna turn it over to you Yeah, so for us growing up, it was not the traditional American Thanksgiving. Uh, My family is Latin, so we usually threw in a few other things like pernil, which is a roast pork shoulder, uh, fried plantains, uh, rice and rice and beans, or rice and pigeon peas, arroz con gandules. Mm. So those were very typical staples that were part of the dishes. I would say there's an affinity to it because families together. My grandfather was an amazing cook and he was a a big part of that as well. But what I think of a lot of times is being in New York and having pumpkin cheesecake. Uh, That may be an abomination to a traditionalist who will only eat regular New York style cheesecake. But this time of year, People go crazy for pumpkin spice latte at Starbucks. You can kick that stuff to the curb. That stuff's just nasty, chemical tasting, fake crap. You you ever try the Dunkin' Donuts version? It's terrible. It's it's, it's disgusting. It's just absolutely disgusting. So for me, it's it's, it's pumpkin cheesecake. It's it's comfort food. It's heavy. It's sweet all at the same time. It's savory. Yeah, it's great. How about you guys? Well, not the pumpkin spice latte, though. No, no. Pumpkin cheesecake. That's terrible. The Dunkin' Donuts or Tim Hortons version of the pumpkin spice latte, by the way, is uh, that's you can just taste the chemicals. Like, however they get to the pumpkin, it's not from pumpkin. <laughs> Salim, you go. Pizza. Yeah. <clears throat> Any time of year. <laughs> Any time of year. If we're talking comfort food, that, 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 but that's n- it. And uh, look, I'm, I'm, none of that corn and yeah, mayo I'm not stuff, into, right? like, um, no, 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 no. Abs- oh, it's disgusting. <laughs> no, just like, just a, uh, n- like simple, simple is best. I mean, pizza margarita, that, that's, that's, mm. that's all I want. I mean, mm. not, 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 nothing else. I think for me, it's a hamburger, but if, but if Great. it's hol, yeah, Beautiful. but if it's holiday related, uh, I guess, oh, well, don't have enough time to talk about it. <laughs> I'm not a holiday person. I know it's after the bell. Okay. Our next topic is, uh, We'll go back to, uh, we'll go to one of Salim's. Uh, f- what's a good souvenir? Salim, what's this one all about? So I was, um, I was traveling uh, domestically the other day and I was, um, 
was talking with my, my with my wife and wondering what should we get you know certain people um as a as a souvenir in japan there's a big souvenir culture you bring back uh, stuff usually typically food um from the from the place that you're visiting uh, something local uh typically going to be something sweet um but i've got um i've got a big magnet collection i love magnets <laughs> and um i love getting them mm. and therefore i i like giving them and there aren't a lot of sort of magnet souvenirs in japan there are, there are some but it's not it's not the tr- the traditional thing that you'd give um so i'm a magnet guy uh and i was wondering what do you guys think i find most souvenirs are are cheesy and terrible and and uh, there's the shot glasses or all some people have shot glass collections um, which I talked about in a f- previous episode. I've, I'm gonna I'm gonna take my little time here to just say the best souvenir I saw was at the the Last Supper. Where that painting that's in Italy, right, Milan. Um, there was mm-hmm. a uh, thing I saw in that gift shop was the were, were mo- um, nail files, <laughs> like little things you would like emery boards with the picture of the Last Supper <laughs> on it. And I thought, man, that's the best <laughs> joke souvenir I've ever seen. So it's like so I, Judas has just worked down to the bone, right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so I've always looked at, when I go into the souvenir shops, I look at and say, what would be the best, tackiest souvenir I could possibly buy in this place? Justin, it, I only gave you seven seconds it, to talk. I, I go with whatever that area is known for. Usually it's a food, a snack, a treat, or something like that. So I just go for the souvenir that area is known for. Well done. Very traditional. <laughs> All right. Okay, wait, stop that. Bell. I have a buddy who loves the shot glasses. I'd always get him that. Go personal if you can, but I always go for yeah, the region. I, I got, go I got a friend too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's good. All right. Uh, next one is... Um, this is a weird one. I was going to skip it, but I'm going to go for it. The use of the phrase, I'm disappointed in you, it... It's a it's a phrase that to me is just so I hate when I when it's said to me whether it's by my wife, <laughs> by whether it's by a a boss. The the is is it appropriate? I mean, how does it make you feel? I've already said how it makes me feel. I'm going to start the timer. I'm so disappointed in you, Salim. Ah, it makes me just want to either rip my eyes out or rip someone else's eyes out. That's 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 violent, isn't it? <laughs> I hate it. I fucking hate it. Oh my god. It just it, it annoys me so much. Um like it, it's so condescending, isn't it? It is. It like, is. And uh, the trigger for me was yesterday we were getting a how to give effective feedback course hmm. and the person running the course yeah. actually used that word those words in the feedback that they were giving an example of how to give effective feedback and they used those where they said, "You know, I noticed the other day and I was really disappointed with what I heard when you were on the phone." I was like, this no. is terrible. It advice. insinuates you have some authority over the person. I mean, yes. it, it, it's condescending, like you said, Salim. Yeah, it's it's yeah. extremely manipulative in my mind. I mean, it, it's used as a weapon by a lot of people. They'll say it in, in a way that's in t- uh, the the tone is intended to be soft, but the the delivery is quite directly harsh. And yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm, on my side, I. I I avoid that like the plague. I mean, I have children and I don't ever use, you know, something like that with them because I'm not disappointed if they screw up on something. It's my job to help them understand what is and isn't a better way to do something in that case. It's not my Mm. job to give, you know, to give them some kind of judgment. 100%. It's like, if, if I'm told I'm, uh, I'm disappointed in you, what am I supposed to do? Like, what do you want me to do? Like, it's like a conversation ender, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Okay, I, you know, what am I supposed to feel sorry for you that you're disappointed? Come on, grow up. Yeah, it's just the, the word just, just sets everything off on the wrong foot, in my opinion. It's terrible. I hate it. Well, I didn't, didn't realize this was going <laughs> to evoke such a, a strong emotional response. Um, not just from you, but from all of us. So interesting. All right. Yeah. It's a good one though. I like that. All right. Let's go with, uh, yeah, right now we, with COVID, we've got the, um, people ordering stuff through these, uh, digital things, QRC codes. Salim, you had this topic, ordering food and drinks at a restaurant digitally, either through a web page or an app. 
Right. You know how like you go to restaurants nowadays um, and, you know, you scan a QR code or you, you, you read a, you type in a, a, web, a web address and uh, opens up the menu. That's how you order. That's how you, you, can, you can pay as well. And I, I get it. Uh, you know, in, in the COVID world, um, I understand, but something about it is just really unper- impersonal. Mm-hmm. And there was this one thing that ha- that happened to me the other day where I was I was ordering I, I ordered uh, a few things including food a- and a coffee, and I-, I don't know maybe this is normal for some people but the uh, they they got they got me the coffee before my lunch and I was like come come on really who has coffee before before lunch maybe some people do but I mean you could have at least asked. Um, but because I ordered it all on the uh, on the app beforehand, it, was, it just See, I would want my coffee before time. my lunch. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And I I would find coffee with lunch a, an odd thing to have actually for me. I wouldn't do that. So coffee with lunch is odd. Coffee before lunch, yes. Yeah, if I'm going to have lunch? it, but I would have it after lunch. Would be when I would have coffee. Typically after lunch. Is, is that what you mean when you after, say right? that that you would you wanted to ha- have it after? I wanted to have it after uh, they bought it. They brought it before got it. lunch. So you didn't want it with lunch. You wanted it. I, no, that, no, no. Okay, I, I get that. That lunch. makes sense to me. Yeah. yeah. And I was having pizza as well, by the way. So. <laughs> Your favorite comfort food. <laughs> and they gave you the coffee. Exactly. I was having the comfort before. food. Before. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Thankfully, you got that pizza to make you feel better after. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> Justin, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would say the negative is there's no response for, with the waiter or waitress about, you know, what the specials are, what works, what what what's out, you know, what has has been, you know, something new to the menu, anything like that. And the positives are, if it's part of like a group company, you get to see all the other restaurants that they own and, uh, and kind of tie into maybe other places you want to check out. Exactly, yeah. And you know, like when you pay at the end, you can just like you know have a moment to say thank mm. you when when the food mm. is really good. There's there's none mm. of that. You just pay pay by the app and, and you're done. Sorry, sorry. I know. Time's okay, up. Larry Merchant. Gotcha. <laughs> that is our time, my guys. On that, uh, I think we got one time for one more. Um, what am I not? What What do you guys want to talk about uh, that I haven't mentioned? Smart devices, smart devices. Because we talked about sandwich feedback. That'll be, we'll do that another time. Um, smart devices, Alexa, Google, uh, Play, Siri, all that stuff. Do you, do you have one? Do you like them? Uh, personally, I'll say I, I have an Alexa and she's hearing me as I say that word right now. Alexa, can you hear me? She's there. You're always there. She says she only listens when she hears the word, her name, which is probably not true, which it's not true because she has to listen to hear to know her name is being said. 100% not true. I like them. Um, They're a glorified uh, cooking timer in our house. So I can set like various timers, like potato timer for this, uh, um, whatever I put in the oven for that. And I love it. Tea timer. uh, and and then if I just want to ask random questions, I, I use it all the time at work. Like if like I'm sitting here, not at work, but when I'm working from home, I'll ask stuff like trend, like giving me conversions on things, adding up certain things. I, I love Alexa. She's annoying at times, but I'm a, I'm an Alexa. I'm an Alexa man. What yeah. about you guys? I'm skipping it. Okay, <laughs> you're skipping. afraid Alexa's gonna. <laughs> Do bad things to you because you're going to say negative things about her, or yeah, yeah you know, it's very similar to that one country I didn't want to mention. You know, who yeah. knows? Who knows? You know, one of these companies I may I may end up having to uh, partner with. Actually, I have. Um, but uh, that being said, I, I don't know. I I I am conscious of things like screen time. I'm conscious of of how much of my my. My, f- my images and different things like that are in very open places. Um, so I, I look at this as another thing to kind of just be a little bit leery of because it's like death by a thousand cuts. The more and more mm. that we kind of give over onto these things, at a certain point, there's no real going back. And, you know, I do realize we're heading in this direction inevitably anyways. But for myself, I try to kind of take a more careful approach. Salim? Did, did, did you know if you say Alexa three times uh, in, the, in the mirror? Jeff Bezos will appear in your living room. Okay, I'm de- definitely that's a nightmare <laughs> right there. <laughs> All right, well that was the end of the the rapid fire, um, and so Justin's got to get uh, some sleep. So we're we're we don't have much more time, but uh, why don't we just uh, wrap up with a quick what we're watching, what we're reading, 
uh, or listening to, and then I can put the how to contact us thing on at the end. But uh, what are you guys watching, reading, or listening to right now? It doesn't have to be all three. Just pick one of those things. I'll give it a go. Uh, so I'm actually watching, uh, on your recommendation, Clark, Afterlife mm. uh, on Netflix, the the Ricky Gervais uh, show. It's really good. It's like, a, it is a, a dark comedy. Yeah. Uh, I, I think you and Paul were having a, a debate about what, 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 what do you call it? Dark black um, comedy? Like a I know, black comedy, I felt a little bit like weird saying that. I was like, is that appropriate to say black comedy? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it's it is a it is a black comedy. It's pretty it's pretty dark, but at the same time, it's it's funny in in a in a Ricky Gervais kind of way. And uh, and you kind of warned me about that. Yeah. Uh, in the beginning, you said if you if you like Ricky Gervais' stuff, you'll you'll really um, enjoy it, and and I do enjoy it. I've only um, finished the first season now. Um, fantastic. Uh, looking forward to the second and I know there's a third coming yes. up so that's going to be uh that's going to be awesome um and sort of going going along with the with the dark theme I'm reading a book from like a like a classic um Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Ooh, Dostoevsky wow. okay. that's not that's not and, light um, I, 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 <laughs> no that, that, that that's not light I read I read that before I go to sleep as well to sort of um you know give me give, give me nice dreams what happens if but, you eat um, pizza while you're reading that book I, I don't know. It might, it might sort of the emotions might balance out, <laughs> but um, I, I was I I'd never read this one before, and I was astounded by how um, first of all vivid it is, uh, and also how like reading it really takes you back to the time, like really takes you back to Saint Petersburg nineteen uh, sorry not nineteen eighteen fifties eighteen sixties. Like you really feel that you're there, uh, and it's amazing how. Uh, the way he, he Dostoevsky writes this book is just absolutely amazing, uh, and I'm really looking forward to. Fin- I'm about halfway through. I'm look, really That's looking awesome. forward to finishing it. All right. What about you, Justin? What's uh, reading, watching, listening to? Uh, well, from the movie side, I recently saw No Time to Die, the last James Bond with Daniel Craig. And I really enjoyed mm. that. I thought Ooh. it was exceptionally done. That was so yeah. good. So that was good. Exceptionally done. Uh, what I'm looking forward to watching soon is the Will Smith uh, playing Venus and Serena's father in King Arthur. I'm hearing great things about that. And uh, Oh, that's what they call the movie, King Arthur? King Arthur. Yeah. I didn't actually know the title. I've heard. Uh, is it out yet? I think so. I think it just yeah. came out in the last like week or two. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody I know saw it and they said they, it was good. Yeah. And then from a reading standpoint, what I read recently was uh, The Devil's Chessboard. Uh, it's by David Talbot. It's about Alan Dulles. Uh, he was one of the key orchestrators to the formation of the CIA uh, and just all the really nasty stuff that he did around World War II, leading up to World War II, during World War II, post-World War II, and all of his involvement and everything from that through JFK and beyond that, um, you know, f- I, you know, the way that, 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 that the U S and, and the three letter organization has been involved in shaping a lot of political imbalances, uh, throughout the world. It's, it was an interesting perspective into all of that and, and who was playing the biggest role in, in a lot of those things and just how nasty, dirty, <laughs> the game is there. Mm. Um, and besides the very serious stuff that I'm reading right now, uh, I'd like to, I'd want to pick up the, the new book by James Andrew Miller. Uh, he's an uh, investigative journalist who writes kind of these, these really long, um, uh, oral histories in a way, uh, of, uh, of big entities. So he wrote about ESPN back in 2011. It was called those guys have all the fun. I read that. It's really good. Uh, so that's inside of the world of ESPN. Uh, 2015, he wrote live from New York, the complete uncensored history of Saturday night live. Again, this guy gets great access to all the stars for these different mm, things. And it's really good. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, in 2017, he wrote this one I haven't read is the CAA book, uh, powerhouse, uh, the untold story of Hollywood's creative artists, artist agency, CAA, which I'm sure you've heard of if you're into sports or entertainment, they're a huge powerhouse agency that covers both ends of that. But the new one that he wrote that I want to read about is uh, HBO oral history called Tinderbox. Uh, it's all about the 
the buildup of HBO and how big a role HBO played in the formation of cable and, um, and, and what, how big a player they've been in, in content, um, and how they've transitioned multiple times via the different ownerships they've, they've had between Time Warner and AT&T and everything else that's happened in the last 10, 15 years as well. So. He's a good writer. Um, if you like Michael Lewis and the, and the things that he's able to do in a very entertaining Love way, Michael Lewis. This is a bit more deep dive and uh, and really mm-hmm. gets gets inside some of these entities. Well, there's a bunch of good books, a bunch of book suggestions through uh, through both you guys there, and and uh, I'm definitely going to look that look that up. I'm gonna I'll be quick with mine. So I read. I already mentioned this in a previous episode that I was reading Bill Bryson's A Walk in the Woods. Uh, I loved it, thought it was fantastic. I've I've read a couple other things of his years ago, and I've always enjoyed his his work. I, I just started reading, or I'm almost finished actually reading a Notes from a Small Island, which uh, he's written a few of these books about a particular country he lives in. So in this case, it's it's uh, um, about um, Great Britain. And his time spent living there. They call it a travel travel book, a humorous travel book on Great Brit- Britain is how it's uh, described. I I liked it. There were some funny moments in it. I now I've been listening to the audio book, so it's him narrating it, which uh, I like that. But I don't I don't find this one as good as A Walk in the Woods. I I was a little bit disappointed with it. So I only. I thought, why do I mention this if I didn't really enjoy it? I did enjoy it, and I think others might. And maybe reading it would be a different experience. That's uh, that could be a topic sometime. Is you know, do you get? Can you shortchange yourself? Can you actually have a better experience if you listen to a book, audio book, or read the book? Something we can maybe chat about in a future episode. But notes from a small island. I'm not doing a great job of selling people on it but i i i i liked it but i just wasn't as i didn't like it as much as a walk in the woods but uh bill bryson i don't know if you guys read any bill bryson before no just no. made a note yeah, of that. satirical uh he writes a lot he's just got such a sharp edge of of humor he's very uh, a walk in the woods i recommend that be the book that you start with if you're gonna wa- mm-hmm. read a mm-hmm. bill bryson book well Sorry, Justin, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, when it comes to, to audiobooks, what I've discovered in myself, at least, is um, I will oftentimes do memoirs in audiobooks because it, it can't help but be a little bit self aggrandizing at times because it is a memoir. It is an autobiography or some version of, you know, of, of their, their, their ideal self that they're presenting. Mm -hmm. And I I find that if I do an audio, I'll stick with it a little bit longer than a physical book. And it's just like, oh my God, I can't take any more of this guy, you know, loving himself. I have to close this. (laughs) But at least with audio, it's just, I could pause it and come back to it, you know, on another Mm -hmm. drive or whatever. Yeah. I thought you were going to say that you find it more difficult listening to someone talking about themselves than reading about it. If it's their own voice. Yeah, maybe. (laughs) Yeah. If it's their own voice, that doubles Mm -hmm. it up. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's another <laughs> one too, is do you prefer to listen to a book narrated by the author or by somebody else? And I think it can go both ways. Um, if I've heard the author before speaking, like Matthew Walker wrote a book called Why We Sleep. And it, he has an audio book that, so I watched his masterclass. I subscribed to masterclass and, and I, I really enjoyed his, his masterclass on sleeping and then I got the audio book and I, it was not by him and I, I couldn't listen to it because I know what he sounds like. And, and it was, mm. it was another person narrating the book and I, I couldn't do it. I, I, I just couldn't do it. Well, we're, uh, we're at our time guys. Um, thanks again for coming back, uh, for another episode. We, I, I purposely wanted this to be one, I didn't have to make you work too hard because the last couple times we've done things together, it's it was movie reviews and book review or documentary reviews and book reviews, and seemed like I was only engaging you for some of the harder work. But uh, I know Justin, you had to do a little bit with your background with the work side of things. But uh, I uh, just want to remind people to how to get a hold of us. It's uh, there's either you can come to our website. Which is at uh, we talked about this dot net. 
I've lost my sheet. I should know it, but is that right? Did I say it right? That's it. We yeah. talked about this. Yep. We talked about this. Yeah, right. yep. And you can also yep. email us at we talked about this 99 at gmail.com. Uh, feedback, topic ideas, suggestions. I even offer up people that want to come on as a guest. Love to hear from you. Love to hear from you. So, gents, final thoughts, closing comments before we, we finish up? No, I mean, just, you know, if we don't do this before the holidays, wishing everyone a, a nice holiday season and, you know, I'm just happy the Knicks are above 500 this far into the season. Bing bong. <laughs> It was, um, no, it was it was really good to get to be back on and uh, really it was um, fun as always uh, and yeah absolutely if we can get a, get another episode in before the uh, before the holidays that'd be awesome uh, but if not yeah happy um, happy holidays to all and um, we'll hopefully catch everyone in the new year sounds good guys all right have a have a good uh, friday night there whatever remains of it and enjoy your weekends thanks you too same to you unique new york unique new york mm, i love scotch i love scotch scotch is got scotch here it goes down down into my belly mm, mm, mm.